Today is our, this is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Wednesday, July the 22nd. Um, just to let everybody know, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, uh, we'll be holding the briefing at 12.30 p.m. That's 12.30 p.m. Uh, as you know, the Ministry of Health estimates uh, will take 15 hours over Thursday and Friday, and so uh, we are fitting the briefing in to meet uh, uh, my obligations and Dr. Henry's obligations for those estimates. Uh, we're honored to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations, and it's also my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, so for our update today, we have 34 new cases of COVID-19 in British Columbia, three of whom are epi-linked and the rest who tested positive. That brings our total to 3,362 people in British Columbia, um, including 1,049 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,742 people in the Fraser Health Region, 141 people on the Vancouver Island Health Region, 304 people now in the Interior Health Region, 69 people in the Northern Health Region, and 57 of whom are people who reside outside of Canada. We have 285 active cases uh, today, of whom 17 people are in hospital, three of whom are in critical care or ICU. We have no new deaths to report today, um, leaving our total at 189 people. 2,888 people have now fully recovered. We continue to have three active outbreaks in our healthcare system, one in long-term care and two acute care outbreaks that are ongoing. Um, and we've had an additional resident test positive, bringing our total number of cases in uh, the healthcare system to 659 people, 403 residents and 256 staff. We have no new community outbreaks. However, we now uh, are following over 70 cases related to the community exposures in and around uh, Kelowna over the last few weeks. As we all know, the BC uh, COVID-19 curve is trending in a direction we do not want to go, and that is upwards. And we all need to take, our, take a step back and look at the things that we need to do to bend our curve back down where we need to keep it. We have proven that we know how to do this, and now each of us needs to do our piece to make that happen. Contact tracing three or four people is much easier and faster than trying to reach 20 or 30 people for every case that has come up. And that is the situation that we have found ourselves in in the last few weeks. With each additional person, the time it takes us to find them, the potential for them to develop symptoms and pass it on to others is greater, putting more people at risk. As a direct result of the recent community exposures in Kelowna, there are now close to a thousand British Columbians in every health authority who are self-isolating at home because they have been exposed to somebody who has been positive for this virus. These means people, this means these people are unable to work, to see friends, to leave their home, to enjoy the summer like the rest of us. So you can protect yourself and your friends and loved ones by protecting their household bubble, keeping those bubbles small, making sure you're not exposing lots of people, spending time with those you know, and using our layers of protection are what is going to help us control the clusters and the transmission we're seeing now and bend our curve back down. Let's stop the spread of COVID-19 with what we know works, safe physical distancing. We know that being outside is better than being inside, and it is good to see so many people enjoying our parks, our beaches, but if you are in a crowded um, location, being outside is not enough. We know that it can be transmitted when you're having close conversations, um, talking, laughing with large numbers of people, even if it is outside. So what does this mean? If you are going to the beach or a lake, choose a quieter spot. Keep away from others. Keep that distance between your group and other small groups. If you're planning to see friends, include only those in your bubble. Recognize that every time you burst your bubble, you are bringing others in and your risk increases. If you're going out for dinner, don't ask the servers to accommodate more than six people. No table hopping. 
Six people is what is restricted under our WorkSafe guidance and our uh, public health orders. So no trying to work around it by sitting separately and moving between tables and gathering. That just puts others at risk. The COVID safety 19 the COVID-19 safety plans are in place for a reason, and these are the, the, the plans that businesses have, have adhered to to make sure that both staff and customers are safe. And these are the plans that we will be monitoring both with WorkSafe and public health inspectors to make sure that we are supporting restaurants and pubs and businesses across the province to keep everyone safe. We also need to remember to wash our hands regularly cleaning more often, following those one-way paths in the stores. That is important. It is a way of helping us protect ourselves, but protect others too. Using our barriers and wearing a mask when distance is difficult are things that we need to do. That is our hierarchy of controls, where we have our distancing between us is what keeps us safe, and also making sure that we're having smaller numbers, washing our hands, following those signs that keep us apart. When traveling, be considerate of the communities you are visiting and use your travel manners at all time. And we can model this for those who are coming into our communities from outside the province or from around the province. Avoid contact with people in smaller communities. Get takeout instead of eating in. Put a mask on if you are popping into the local grocery store for extra supplies. And of course, considerate travel includes always, always, without exception, delaying your trip and staying away if you're feeling unwell. Over the, cast, the past few weeks, we've recognized that risks within bars and nightclubs and recent links to exposures in these locations have occurred. And as we've discussed, we are now amending the provincial health order to put in place more restrictions, more things that will help us control those environments and make them safer. All patrons must now be seated at a designated seat. There's no liquor self-service or dance floors and measures need to be in place to reduce lineups and gatherings and pressure points. Changes in the requirements for events, as we call them, have also been made to further reduce the potential of transmission in these higher risk environments. The details of this amended order will be posted online shortly. And I want to say thank you to the industry reps, um, the people who worked at the BCCDC with WorkSafe BC and with my office and others to make the changes, to find practical ways that we can assist industries in keeping the bars and pubs and all of the things that we are enjoying open but safe and safe for all of us. And we need to do our part by not trying to bend those rules. And let's focus our efforts, be mindful of those around us and give each other the space to stay safe. We can all have fun and a safe summer despite COVID-19. We are not going to go back to things we had to do earlier this year, but to do, in order to keep going forward, we need to go back to safe social interactions. We need to play safe and stay safe. Fewer faces and working together as we have done to flatten our curve once again. We have all worked hard We've made sacrifices, and now's our time to make sure that we continue to benefit from those sacrifices. So let's all do our part and be kind and be calm and be safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. Uh, we're obviously uh, gratified again today that we have no deaths to report from COVID-19 in BC. I believe that's six straight days. But it should be said over those six days, we've had uh, over 190 uh, new cases of people testing positive for COVID-19. And that's obviously a concern. So a slight increase today in hospitalizations from 15 to 17. The number of people in critical care is the same. But we do know that when we have new cases, that puts new risks in our communities. And we have to take steps to ensure that transmission is stopped where it can be stopped and contr controlled where it occurs. I wanted to, um, and that's why uh, the, uh, the Provincial Health Office has put in 
some changes in consultation with business shares, but some changes that will have the effect, I think a positive effect, in controlling and stopping transmission. I wanted to acknowledge in particular the staff of the Interior Health Authority, particularly those working in the Okanagan, who are doing extraordinary work. As we all know, uh, having followed uh, uh, this pandemic closely in briefings over the last six months, uh, the pandemic has been centered in different places in the province at different times, but primarily in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority and the Fraser Health Authority. But over the last week, there has been a very significant uh, mobilization of effort in interior health in response to, uh, to the cases both in interior health and those linked to travel to interior health. And, uh, and uh, just note, five times uh, the number of tests than before, because uh, as people require that in Kelowna, twice as many in Penticton, significant increase in testing hours. And we hope, even though some people uh, may feel it's taken too long to get the results of their test, we'll see continued resources applied uh, to testing to ensure that people get the responses they need. But I want to acknowledge the extraordinary work of um, uh, of Dr. Uh, Pollock, of Dr. Mima, and, and all of their teams in interior health who have, I think, responded to this challenge with, uh, with uh, generosity, thoughtfulness, and unbelievable hard work. Uh, I would just want to say that uh, to everybody, that tomorrow, as you know, we'll do our regular briefings around surgeries and around visits and long-term care. The fact that in the last number of weeks we have exceeded last year's totals of surgeries in the context of a COVID-19 pandemic is an enormous achievement. The fact that we've started in long-term care visits across British Columbia and we've heard from people who have had those visits and what that means to them, all of that has been dependent on all of our action to flatten the curve. It is a necessary prerequisite that we continue to do that over time and therefore it is not too late to recommit to stopping the spread of COVID-19 in BC. We must go back to what we know works. We know it worked. We saw it in our own study, our own serological study in British Columbia last week. We must use our COVID sense to keep us safe and stop the spread. Using our COVID sense means we know this, that physical distancing saves lives that wearing a mask is the right thing to do when we can't maintain physical distance, that we keep our numbers of contacts small, that there's a huge upside in being outside, that we must wash our hands often for 20 seconds with soap and water, that we must listen and be respectful to people who are asking us to take actions in their store or in their restaurants that will keep us healthy, our friends healthy, our families healthy, and stop the spread, and that we always, always, always stay home and stay away from others if we feel sick. Respecting, remembering, and ritualizing these skills is our COVID sense. Using our COVID sense will drive our numbers of new cases into decline. Using our COVID sense means we're acting to bend the curve, not the rules. We are counting on one another. We are counting on each other to continue to stop the spread. We are counting on each other to con continue to be 100% all in in our BC effort. We are counting on each other. Our COVID-19 future depends on each one of us, each and every day. But today it is, of course, not too late to join in, not too late to join the fight. Today we can recommit to stopping the spread and we cannot let each other down. Aujourd'hui nous annonçons uh, uh, 34 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positif pour COVID-19 pour un total de 3,362 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Il n'y a eu aucun nouveau décès lié au COVID-19 et je m'en réjouis pour un total de 189 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous continuons à offrir nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches pendant cette pandémie. Chaque régie de santé de la Colombie-Britannique compte des patients atteints de COVID-19. 1049 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, 1742 à Fraser, 100 41 sur l'île de Vancouver, 304 dans l'intérieur et 69 au nord. Il y a aussi 67 cas de personnes qui vivent en dehors du Canada. À ce jour, 2888 personnes dont le test de dépistage de COVID-19 était positif sont maintenant rétablis. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We're happy to take your questions.
Thank you, Minister. For a reminder for everybody on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. Please also unmute your phones. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question is from Hina Alam, Canadian Press. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, I hope you're doing okay. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, explain a, uh, to us a little bit about what is behind the increase in this curve. Is it because we opened too soon uh, or uh, something else, and uh, do you think we should go? Uh, we should roll back some of our measures. Yeah. So no, I don't believe it's because we opened too soon. We have been very measured. We knew that we would have an increase in cases um, as people started to have more contacts, and we've done it in a very measured and and I believe thoughtful way. In that we've taken the incubation period between each step. And it is not surprising to me now that we have people traveling more that we are going to see more cases. But it is a wake up sign to us that we need to pay attention to those settings where it's more likely that transmission can happen. And right now, those settings are where people are going and traveling to the interior. They're getting together with small groups, but different small groups every night. So it may be less than our, our 50 limit that you're having a party with a host party or on a host boat or in a, a, one of the restaurants. And, and so we need people to start paying attention again to the fact that every time you meet a whole group of new people, you are exposing yourself to their risks. And what has happened is people have come into those environments with, with COVID and it has spread. So we need to get on top of it. We knew that we were trying to minimize the new cases, and that's been one of the things that we've been trying to do. We now have some clusters that are related to this travel, particularly. Um, we're managing it by the case management and the contact tracing that we're doing with, through public health. And that's why I mentioned today that you know we have about a thousand people right now who have been close contacts of somebody who's tested positive for COVID-19. They're now in their incubation period, and some of those people will become ill in the next few weeks. So those people, we need to make sure that we're supporting them to stay home and stay away from others so that during that period, if and when they get sick, they're not going to spread it on to the next generation of people. So that's our focus right now. This is not um, a failure of anything we've been doing. We've always said that we will tweak things, we will manage things, we will make changes as we need to, um, to adjust to the scenarios that we're being faced with. So that's why we're changing the orders, for example, for nightclubs, putting in some additional measures to make it easier for the people who own and manage the nightclubs to ensure that those safe distancing, those measures are in place, that people aren't um, bending and disobeying those rules, particularly after they've had a few drinks and it's late at night. So we're putting in those things now where we've always said we'll adjust and we'll manage as we go. And that's what we're doing. And we'll, we're at the point where we need to make some changes and we need everybody to be aware that these are risky times and it jeopardizes a lot of what we have accomplished and where we have been. So we need to pay attention and use our travel manners, make sure that we um, stick to the basics that we know work. Do you have a follow-up, Hina? Yes, thank you. Uh, also, Dr. Henry, I was wondering if you believe that the actual count is higher than uh, what, uh, what's been uh, reported. Uh, are there more people who might be infected but uh, don't uh, are asymptomatic and may not be coming forward because they don't realize it, or they just uh, they don't realize they have COVID or anything like that? Uh, like the CDC was saying that their count is uh, probably higher than what they've been than the official count. Yeah, and, and absolutely. We do know that it's absolutely going to be higher. Um, so that's why it's really important for anybody who has any symptoms and anybody who's concerned who has had these types of high risk exposures that they monitor very carefully and we get testing very rapidly. We, we've so shown in our Ciro survey that we presented last week that there's probably about eight times more people um, who were infected over the last few months um, than we detected by the, the, the testing that we were doing. 
Having said that, it's not going to be as great a differential right now because we know our testing has been expanded and our test positivity rates, so the, the number of positives for every 100 tests we do, still remains quite low. So that tells us that the it, it gives us a measure of how much transmission is in the community. So yes, while I expect we are missing some cases, we're not going to be missing as many as in uh, some of the U.S. numbers, for example, or for uh, as many as we missed or we didn't test for earlier on when we didn't have the testing capacity and we were focusing on ensuring we were protecting our health system. So many of our uh, additional cases that we picked up with the blood test were people who had traveled and come back to Canada to BC to their home in March when we were telling people even if they had m relatively mild symptoms to stay home. So we don't believe that differential is as great but there is clearly going to be some people who have mild enough in the illness that it's missed. Whether they transmit it to large numbers of people or not, um, that's when we start to pick up. And that's when we feel that we find people. If there is transmission happening, um, we pick up those people who become sick because we don't have a lot of asymptomatic to asymptomatic to asymptomatic transmission. It, it results in people developing symptoms, which is a bit of a roundabout way of saying it. <laughs> Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Dr. Henry, uh, there's video circulating and pictures from a drum circle uh, last night uh, in Stanley Park where it looked like hundreds and hundreds of young people were gathering uh, closely together. Uh, what did you think of those images? And does there need to be stricter enforcement from health officials in the province, the park board says it's up to the provincial government to enforce this in order to crack down on events like this. Yeah, so uh, I think there's a couple of things. When I saw some pictures, it looked like a beautiful evening and I can see why people want it to be out there to experience that. But, um, you know, it, it is it is one of those scenarios where we don't want lots of people to crowd together for periods of time and have close conversations. Being outside means it's less risky, but it's not zero risk. So we are appealing to people, again, to remember that and to keep your group small. Stay a distance, your safe distance from other small groups. And then you can enjoy the beaches, you can enjoy um, the, the, you know, the sunsets and the water around BC. Um, in terms of the enforcement of, of parties and events that are happening, bylaw officers are able to do that. Um, certainly there's um, people within Vancouver Coastal Health, our environmental health officers who are part of the enforcement, mostly in uh, establishments like food and liquor establishments. Um, we also know that, uh, uh, th that there are bylaw officers who are able to uh, uh, work across the province on some of these issues. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? I do. And on schooling, Leger Polling just released a survey today showing overwhelmingly British Columbia parents are in favor of both kids wearing masks at school uh, and a hybrid learning model. Uh, what are your thoughts on both those issues, but predominantly on whether there will be a mandate for kids to wear masks uh, at school come September? Yeah, I can say no, there will not be a mandate for kids to wear masks at schools. We know from the evidence around the world that, that that's not, one, not needed, but there are other ways, important ways of being able to learn in classroom for young children, for children of all ages, that can be done safely. And masks for long periods of time are not recommended by anybody um, in any situation. We know that that is not what keeps people safe. But it, it, if we talk about our hierarchy of controls, the most important thing is distancing, making sure that we have small numbers of people, making sure that we have barriers in place, administrative ways of, of reducing risks. And for schools, we've been doing a lot of work with the experience that we've had in June to understand how that can be done safely across all grades. And we'll be talking more about that coming up. There's been a lot of thought and effort put into it um, by, uh, by groups, including the, un the teachers unions, um, learners and parents as well as the, our school districts around the province and my office has been involved as well. So there'll be much more information coming about that and you know our goal is to have as many children as possible back in school in a learning environment. We know that it's important 
for a whole variety of reasons for children to have in-classroom learning. And we know that it's important for educators to have that environment as well. And it can be done safely. You know, none of us wanted to have a pandemic imposed upon us for sure. But we do know that we can manage this safely in our schools and we'll be looking at how we can do that. And uh, more information will be coming soon. Next question is from Shannon Patterson, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. If we take out the Kelowna outbreak, the province's daily infection rate is actually holding fairly steady. Is it time for more regional restrictions to control that kind of localized spread? Yeah, see, I think the challenge is it's um, the impact of what's happened and it just happens to be Kelowna because that is an area that many people have traveled to and that's where we've had introductions and spread. But these are the same issues across the province. People are traveling across the province. There's people in every health authority that are in isolation right now because they were exposed at an event somewhere in the Okanagan or um, exposed to somebody who got sick when they came home from an event in the Okanagan. So so we are looking at not so much you know, a regional approach, but more what are the scenarios, the settings that apply across the province. So the issues that we've been having around exposures in um, nightclubs and events, they're the same everywhere. So we're looking at how we can have restrictions in those areas across the province. Having said that, we are, uh, um, and I've been talking with my colleagues in, in Interior Health about whether we need to put some restrictions at this period of time, given the numbers of people who are positive and the numbers of contacts right now, um, restrictions to gatherings that are slightly different for the Central Okanagan to try and address some of the current issues. So we need to look at you know, what it makes sense to do provincially and what makes sense to do on a regional basis. Do you have a follow-up, Shannon? Yeah, can we go back to the drum circle at Third Beach? Obviously, that's an outdoor gathering that was much, much larger than 50 people. What do you want to see happen to organizers of events like that? Do you think they need to be spoken to by provincial health? Both police and the park board told us they can't enforce physical distancing. So I'm sort of following Richard's question, who does? And do you think the province needs to get more involved when we see something like this? Uh, well, I, I think um, I'm not sure that I agree with them. We, are, we have guidance about the, the physical distancing. We have guidance about events. And, you know, this was, I understand, not so much an organized event, but uh, a coming together of people. And we do remind people. And we have always taken the um, compliance and education approach to this. And we should do so again. And that is my approach to this. And that's what we will continue to do. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, in light of your amended order, I'm wondering if you can kind of set the record straight on how the public is kept informed about COVID exposures. So what is the criteria or threshold for an alert and then whose responsibility is it to issue an alert or a notice? Yeah, so that's public health. Um, so it's local public health, the MHOs and the health authorities, and it depends uh, on the scenario. So we have very set guidance for declaring outbreaks in some settings, like healthcare settings, like long-term care homes, schools, for example. But in other settings, it really depends on whether we, there's a risk to the public. So if we are able to find everybody who was at a, uh, an event, a party, for example, we have everybody's contact information. We know that there's nobody else that we need to follow up, then we don't um, necessarily have to put out a public notice. So for example, um, we've had public notices about uh, restaurants, we've had public notices about um, a number of bars and nightclubs here in Vancouver. And the reason why we put out those public notices was because we could not be sure that we found everybody who was in that, uh, uh, that place during the exposure period. If we, and one of the things that we put in the order is that uh, people have to take down a name and contact information. And that's for two things. One, so we can find people quickly and that we can find everybody who was there. So we need to reinforce that. It's in our best interest to give the restaurant our name and phone number so that if there was somebody there who uh, was sick and was uh, put us at risk, then we can be contacted quickly and we know what to do so that we can protect those who are closest to us as well. So there's a variety of things that we look into it. It depends a little bit about um, you know, where the setting is that it's happened. 
how many people have been exposed, what type of exposure it is, and, uh, and whether we are able to effectively find people um, who may have been at risk. Do you have a follow-up, Tanya? Please, thanks. Uh, many have been asking, you know, why were health alerts not issued for the closure of the Browns in Port Moody and the Earls in Port, Port Coquitlam until days after the restaurants had closed? And, and with that example, you know, would there be a consideration to increase communication to the public when there are these exposures? Uh, and if we could get an answer in French as well, please. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, it depends. Some of these are uh, come from the restaurants themselves or the exposure uh, places themselves, and they do it out of uh, uh, a way to um, be proactive with their public. And it may not have been on the advice of public health. Public health will make those decisions if we will make those um, announcements if we need to. But those uh, businesses can. Um, put out their own announcements if they want to. So it's essential if we we uh, direct them to do it, but they're able to do it as a way of um, just reassuring their customers and their, the people that work in the facility that uh, that the right measures have been taken. So there's a bit, a bit of a balance there, but in terms of who orders people to make sure there's a public exposure, that would be public health. Oui, c'est la, la santé publique dans le régime de santé qui tranche sur ces questions. Il y a bien entendu euh, des restaurants, par exemple, qui ont choisi euh, une fermeture pour rassurer leur public. Et ça, c'est, je pense, normal et une pratique euh, très raisonnable. Mais c'est la décision de la santé publique de, de, qui, en fin de compte, tranche sur ces questions. C'est important de savoir que dans certaines circonstances où c'est impossible de, de contrôler qui était là ou pas dans une soirée, par exemple, particulière, de faire une déclaration d'une de, de, situation qui, euh, par exemple, on, on l'a vu à Vancouver Coastal Health il y a quelques semaines. Donc, euh, euh, quand on ne peut pas trouver tout le monde, c'est de temps en temps nécessaire de déclarer la situation. La question du, du, euh, de, de, euh, des, des centres de soins ou des hôpitaux est différente. Il y a des règles très claires sur ces questions et bien entendu, on, on, on sait dans chaque cas quand il y a un problème euh, dans un centre de santé, que ce soit un centre de soins de long terme ou un, un hôpital. Mais euh, maintenant, heureusement, on en a trois et, et il y a un dans le, dans tout, dans le système en général, donc euh, on a quatre euh, dans toute la province. Mais, euh, mais bien sûr, euh, c'est une décision très claire dans le système de santé, euh, de, de la santé publique, de communiquer cela à tout le monde à cause des risques dans une, euh, dans une scène comme un hôpital. Next question is from Kat Slepian, Black Press. Hi, Dr. Henry. Um, I wanted to ask about accommodation bookings for bigger groups since uh, we've entered phase three. Um, we've been told to keep our bubble small and, you know, to stay outdoors, you know, the fewer spaces, bigger spaces. Um, but companies like Airbnb are still offering uh, rentals for groups of 10 to 12 or even more people. Is that a concern uh, as we try and crack down on this new spike? Yeah, um, it depends on the size of the place that they're renting. But if your family is a large family and that may be up to 10 or 12 people, um, you know, that makes sense. If that is your bubble, um, where I have concerns is where um, they're renting a, a number of rooms to different groups of people and then they're inviting people over and that's what we're seeing is, you know, people are um, sometimes spontaneously, sometimes with intent, having larger groups and parties that are coming together and we're seeing um, that that right now um, means that, that we've seen transmission of the virus in those settings. So we need to stop that at this point. Yes, it's okay to meet up with your group of friends, your close group of friends, whether that's um, eight or 10 or, or 12 people, but stick with your own group and not mixing with other groups because that's where we're seeing right now that there's risk of transmission of this virus. Do you have a follow-up, Kat? Um, yeah, and then kind of about the people uh, who have contracted COVID-19 so far, 
Um, we're hearing a lot uh, kind of worldwide about lasting health implications. Is that something uh, health officials in BC or the CDC uh, have noticed uh, or have been looking into here? Yes, absolutely. Um, and most of the people that have been infected in the last few weeks, we're seeing an increase in younger people who tend to have milder illness that recovers more quickly. But there are some people, even young people, who get very sick and end up in hospital. And we know that there's spillover. So we may be young and healthy, but we go home and pass it on to our parents, our grandparents. And we've now seen a couple of people related um, who have now in hospital in, well, one person in interior health, uh, for example example. But um, we do, even people who've had relatively mild illness, we have now come to understand that some people have a prolonged recovery that may take weeks. Um, particularly, they, they describe feelings of, of profound fatigue that can last for a long time, shortness of breath with even minimal exertion. And this happens to young people. So this really can um, knock you on your, <laughs> your flat on your back for a long time. And that's why it is so important that we stop the transmission mission, even if we feel like we're young and healthy and we're going to be just fine. Um, there are people in their 20s and 30s and 40s who have died from this disease, but more importantly, it does make people sick and some people get sick for a long period of time. Next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Health Minister Dix, uh, thank you for taking my question. I wanted to ask you about hospital protocols that are now being relaxed with staff reporting that people are no longer wearing masks and visitors are coming and going into areas where there have been patients with compromised immune systems. Um, are you aware that hospitals are no longer screening people or not all hospitals are screening people as they come and go? It is our expectation that people will be screened. Visitors are still restricted to hospitals as they are to long-term care. Um, and it is an incredibly important piece. We do, um, I mean, uh, right now we have very few people in hospital with COVID-19. Um, so it is a matter of ensuring that we're doing what we can to keep people out who may have that. Um, and, you know, emergency departments have protocols in place. There, There is no need at this point with the uh, low level that we have in our community for all hospital uh, healthcare workers to wear masks at all times in a hospital setting. We may get to that um, if we start to see increased respiratory illness and community transmissions in the fall. But right now, that's not a requirement uh, from an infection control um, perspective. This is to say that the, the policy in acute care is to limit visits to what are defined as essential visits. Those include uh, for people in the uh, disability community, their advocates, but uh, that's the policy in acute care and that has not changed since we changed and adjusted the policy on essential visits, I believe that was in May. So that continues uh, to be the case. Uh, we are in the midterm, I think it's fair to say, looking at uh, some policies in, in, with respect to visits in hospital involving uh, a number, two sets of uh, people. I think uh, children is one set of people and the other group are people who would you call uh, alternate level of care patients who are long term, who are, who are at least uh, are in hospital largely because they are not, they have not found an appropriate bed in a long term care home. And so we're looking at those issues, but those haven't been changed. Uh, Marcella, I'm interested, of course, to hear uh, what you're saying, but uh, the rules haven't changed on uh, on visits in hospital, and I don't expect them to change uh, for some time. Do you have a follow up, Marcella? Uh, well, just a follow up for Minister Dix, because we've heard from Dr. Henry about the drum circle at at the beach. But what was running through your mind last night when you or today when you found out that there are thousands of people crowding onto a beach without wearing masks? Well, I didn't. I didn't see thousands of people, but but um, and so uh, what I what I was reminded of, in all cases, is that uh, everybody has their own responsibilities in this, and sometimes the responsibility is placed on the organizers of an event, a group of people who may well have come together in a drum circle. But we all have responsibility here to ensure one another is safe. And I just want to remind everybody. That, a lot, that the majority of COVID-19 transmission occurs indoors and it occurs amongst people you know and, it, and it's mo in its greatest frequency amongst people you may love. And so we have a responsibility here, all of us together, 
to ensure that we maintain physical distancing, that we, of course, enjoy the summer outside, that we're prudent in our own homes and the way that we conduct ourselves. It's important for us and it's important for everyone. I also want to say that overwhelmingly, I mean, I, I hear because these events are visible and they're outside, they get a lot of focus. But overwhelmingly, certainly in my neighborhood, people are following the advice of Dr. Henry. And I think that's true in most places. And, you know, I, I have heard this argument that, well, that person over there isn't following the advice every time. That somehow relieves the obligation on me. It doesn't in any way. This is our battle together. And the fact that we're doing surgeries in hospitals, the fact that we have visits in long-term care, the fact that we had children in school in June, uh, in a way that I think has expressed remark. I heard Premier, Premier Kenny uh, celebrating what happened in British Columbia yesterday in his presentations. The fact that we've had all th these things is because we've done this together, and I think we just have to, in, in, our, in the way that we conduct ourselves, listen to that advice, because we did this, this extraordinary thing that happened in BC at huge cost to lots of people. We did this together, and we have to recommit ourselves today I know that happened on Sunday or Saturday, but today or Monday, whenever it happened, that uh, we commit ourselves today to doing better together and doing it for one another. Next question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for, for taking my question. I know in Interior Health, uh, they had two active cases for the longest period of time. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, they've gone from 2 to 81 as of today, which I assume is one reason why you're looking at, at special restrictions there. I wonder if you could provide some examples of potential, what we're talking about, or what you're talking about when it comes to potential different restrictions for such places as Central, Central Okanagan. Yeah, so we've been in discussions about uh, numbers of peoples in gatherings, for example, and it may be prudent given that um, that is an area where people are going to travel and visit and it happens every summer in the in the South Okanagan and Central Okanagan, actually through the interior. We know that it's a popular place for people to go um, and that has proven to be uh, a venue right now where um, we get transmission. So, you know, and we've had people in groups that are larger than are manageable and it's put a strain on us being us in public health being able to um, contact people quickly and that has led then to uh, additional transmission chains. So for the next incubation period what we need to do is be able to rapidly find people, rapidly ensure that they have what they need to stay away from others, get tested, um, be monitored and so to facilitate that we may need to adjust things like the numbers of people and we can look at you know, rental agencies like Airbnb we talked about, like people who rent uh, houseboats and other boats where people are using those as they did every summer to go out and, and to have parties and maybe put rafts together and, and join with other groups. And right now we need to stop doing that. We need to focus on having our own small group together and uh, focus on our friends um, and our family. Do you have a follow up, Keith? Uh, yes, uh, back to the nearly 1,000 people self-isolating, which seems like a, a phenomenal contact, contact tracing uh, exercise there. Do you expect that number or anticipate that number to grow? And if so, is it, would it be significant or is it just going to continue to climb? Well, it, it depends. So early on um, in this pandemic, we had large numbers of people for each case. It averaged about 11, but there were some people who had like 100, 120 contacts, which made us scramble. Um, right, right now, we're starting to see that creep up again. During the period where we had our restrictions in place and people were following them, um, the average number of contacts dropped to, to three. So we're, we want to be somewhere in between there where it's manageable for us. What we're seeing in, in the Okanagan, and this is why Interior Health is looking at some um, more restrictions in numbers of people that gather, is that uh, people were having 20 or 30 contacts. And that makes it much, challenging, much more challenging for us to find people in a timely way, because we want to find people within 24 to 48 hours before they start to show symptoms. So we know in the incubation period, it's up to 14 
15 days, but most people will start to get sick at day five, day seven. So we want to find everybody before that period of time so that they don't have the opportunity to pass it on to somebody else. So the fewer people that we have, um, the better we're able to do that. And right now we know that it's a, bit, it's a risky proposition in much of the interior to have those types of parties. The other part of it was that people didn't always know the people they were with, which made it harder for us to find them. So those are the things we need to think about now. And it, it applies because we are seeing transmission in the in, in the Okanagan, but it also applies around the province and, you know, on the Gulf Islands here in Victoria and Vancouver. People are traveling, they're getting together and they're enjoying the summer, but we need to do it with smaller groups. We need to make sure we know who we're with so that if somebody inadvertently brings it into our bubble, we're able to protect everybody as rapidly as we can. We have time for one more question this afternoon. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released shortly. For recommendations on protecting families and communities and for access to provincial guidance on COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Victor Kaiser, Radio NL. Hi, uh, Dr. Henry. I was just hoping you could expand uh, perhaps more on the events, I guess, at restaurants and bars. I know there's restrictions on self-service, like you said, and uh, dance floors and things of that nature. But, uh, you know, what about things like uh, karaoke, perhaps, or trivia nights and that kind of stuff where people may be seated for the most part? I imagine karaoke is a no-go since you'll have to stand up. But uh, what about uh, trivia and things like that? Yeah, so uh, those are exactly what we're talking about. We've defined these events um, that, that many uh, restaurant and bars want it to, uh, uh, to have um, the ability to have entertainment. And so nightclubs, for example, are using their, their um, food um, beverage license to have entertainment. Um, but there needs to be restrictions in those entertainment. So karaoke, we need to have physical barriers, people separated. Um, there's uh, guidance from WorkSafe BC and how that can be done. Um, but what we're finding is, what we were finding was that people were allowed to stand at tables rather than sit. And then of course, after having a few drinks, people felt that they could mingle more freely. So we're putting in a, a, some things to make it a calmer environment, to keep those separation, making sure that there's no, um, not everybody getting up and dancing, no dance floors. So those are the types of things as well, um, limiting the hours for events. So it used to be, uh, we didn't have a restriction in hours, so we're looking at limiting the hours to 11 o'clock um, and then the event must be over, um, recognizing that uh, it's later into the night when people have had a few drinks that they're more likely to uh, bend the rules. Do you have a follow-up, Victor? I do, yes. Uh, you know, I've been to a few restaurants myself, uh, you know, as uh, going out, and I've seen in some places a lot of servers don't have, you know, things like masks on. Yes, they're wiping tables down and you have the protective screens, uh, but they're table hopping without the masks. And also there's been some concerns with larger groups too on uh, uh, people, you know, harassing servers to seat the groups together. I think you've kind of touched on that briefly as well. So what can or should happen in, I guess, both these situations? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the rules around restaurants are very clear and they are clear and we've tried to, we've adjusted them to make it uh, manageable, but it really is um, incumbent on the owners and operators to make sure that people are adhering and, and they can do that and we and public health can assist them. Um, there'll be uh, more inspections, making sure that people are adhering to their COVID-19 safety plan that everybody has to have. And uh, yes, uh, that means small numbers of people, six at a table with either physical distancing or barriers between tables. And no, you can't put those tables together. And no, you can't have a whole bunch of tables and everybody um, hopping and mixing between them. And I know it sometimes is challenging for servers to deal with that. And um, there needs to be a plan within the restaurant itself to make sure that uh, we can support people to follow those rules because those are rules. They are in the orders and we don't have a lot of them, but these are some of the very basic ones. In terms of wearing masks, um, it, it, you know, the, it, a mask is an added layer if you can't maintain that physical distance. So the, the, what we are trying to do in restaurants is that's one of the reasons why the groups are small so that tables can be spaced enough apart um, and that the server can spend minimal amount of time. So when we're talking about risk of transmission, it's both proximity 
proximity, so distance and time. So the server should pro provide things to you, step away, not have um, talk in close to people. Um, and in that, those situations, a mask is not always required. It often is required in the kitchens, for example, so that people who are working closely to each other um, and aren't maintaining that distance at all times aren't um, spreading germs to each other. So there are situations where, um, it, where if, the, if things are being done and you have those administrative controls and people are behaving in the way we need them to, um, that masks are not required. The time we have for today, thank you.